Hey everybody, it's Hayden here from Top Dog. I hope you're having a good day. So you're here because you want to get prepared for your reading comprehension stats paper, right? Well, you've clicked on the right video. In this video, I'll be going over some top tips, some strategies, a few question examples, and just generally giving you some information about how the stats paper works. Hopefully, by the end of the video, you'll feel much more prepared and ready to take it on. So let's dive straight in. First of all, bit of information, all right? So the reading test, you've probably done some mock tests at school, let's be honest. The reading test always consists of three separate texts. You get one hour to do the test, which, you know, logic says approximately 20 minutes then per paper. What usually happens is the first text is a little bit easier, so it might take a bit less than 20 minutes, giving you some extra time for that last text, which is usually a bit harder. That just tends to be the way it goes. So for example, there, look, we've got some different papers from across the years and all of them, as you can see, have three different texts. Now, usually as well, there's, there's some sort of story, some kind of fiction. There's quite often a fact file. In fact, I think there's been a fact file in, in the last five or six sats. And then the last one, sometimes it's a poem, sometimes it's another story, but just with slightly more difficult vocabulary. Now, <clears throat> It's important for you to understand that there are eight types of questions that come up. Now, this is a bit boring, but it's really important you understand it because then you can have a bit of a, a head start on other people, right? So on the, on the left here are these codes. You don't need to worry about the codes, but these are the eight types of questions that come up. Okay, so we have word meaning questions. You know what that means, just asking you about the meaning of words in context, where sometimes you have to read around a sentence, work out what a word means or how it contributes to the story. Then you've got retrieval questions, very common. Find and copy one word, those kind of things. Summarizing ideas across paragraphs. So that is really reliant on you taking in everything as you're reading it and making sure you understand the actual flow of the story or whatever it is you're reading. Making inferences, everybody's favorite. This is what we spend most of the time doing at school with you guys. Um, it's about inferring information. So reading between the lines, as we call it, understanding what's going on behind the scenes just from the text you're given. Prediction, then you've got these two, which are a bit strange, but they're, they're essentially, 2F and 2G are both just about how words, phrases, or even paragraphs or information in the story contributes to the kind of meaning as a whole. Like the, maybe, it, maybe it adds something to the whole story or adds something to the whole fact file. And the, far, the last one is uh, making comparisons. So it might ask you to make comparisons between two areas of the text or two characters etc. But to be honest with you guys, it's really weird because there's, even though there's eight of these question types, only three of them really, really come up. The other ones, you, you barely get any questions on the other five. I wonder if you know what they are. Have a think. What three question types there do you reckon come up loads and loads and loads? Well, have a think. I'll show you as well. So as you can see from my screen, I'm just going to drag this up just so we can focus on one at a time. As you can see, I've got the question types along the top, the eight question types there. Now I looked at the 2022 paper and this is how many, this is a tally of how many questions we had in that paper of that kind of question type. So as you can see, huge chunk of the paper was just retrieval and inference. You look at the rest of the paper, there's one of these questions, what one prediction, one of these, there was zero of these ones. It didn't have any of those question types in there. So really heavily weighted towards retrieval, inference, and a bit of word meaning as well. If we go back, if we go back a few years, obviously in 2021 and 2020, there were no SATs. I know, sorry guys, but COVID was around and the SATs got canceled for that reason. But look again, we've got word meaning, retrieval, inference. If I go back down again, the next two years, you can see word meaning was a bit heavier back then, 2018, 2017, but it's still these three. Can you see that? Look, you know, there's some three years in a row, there wasn't a single prediction question. So if you want to focus uh, tonight or whenever it is, you know, if you, before your test, maybe, maybe you're well ahead and looking at this a year in advance, then these are the ones you want to focus on. Okay, this one, this one, and this one. And that's exactly what we're going to do a little bit of later. So let's think about some strategies now. Because I always talk to the children in my class and the children that we tutor about strategies. Everyone's different. But there's a few ways of tackling the reading test, right? Some teachers might say, right, go on then, spend the first five minutes reading the text. And this is a good method, okay, in its own, in its own way, because by reading the whole text, at least you're more likely to understand how the whole story flows. And you're going to be more likely to answer those questions that ask you to summarize things across paragraphs or ask you to uh, explain how a word contributes to the whole story because you know what the whole story is. But I know that a lot of children prefer method two, which is not reading the whole text at the start, because if you've got a memory like mine, like a goldfish, 
by the time I've got to the end of the text, I've already kind of forgotten what happened at the start anyway. I might have a rough idea, but I can't remember the details. So what I tend to do, and what a lot of children tend to do, is just go back and forth between the text and the questions. Maybe you read the first couple of paragraphs of the text, and then you think, right, that's enough information for now. I'm going to go and look at question one, question two, question three, and just see what I can answer. And when, when you start feeling like, well, oh, maybe I need to read a bit more because I'm not too sure on my answer here, or I haven't seen suitable evidence yet in the text to support this answer, that's when you might want to just go back to the text, read a bit more, go back and forth, back and forth. I've met a lot of successful children who have utilized this method really effectively. And method three... Guys, we're not doing method three. Do not guess all the answers. Don't be that person that sits there and goes, oh, yep, finished after five minutes. Oh, I guessed them all. Don't be that guy. So we're getting rid of that one. Method one or method two, maybe you've got your own method as well that works for you. And if you do, stick with that because that's good. We're all different. These are just two very popular strategies. I've got some 10 out of 10 strategies for you to use. Now, a lot of children find this hard. So if you find this a bit hard, then maybe now's not the time. But do consider this. Summarizing. Summarizing in general as you go is a really, really good strategy for uh, improving your chances of not missing out key information and also not falling into traps in the questions. Because let's face it, sometimes the questions are worded in a way where the majority of us misinterpret what it's actually asking us. Now, what you can do to summarize is as you're reading the text, let's say you read the first two or three paragraphs, why don't you just jot to the side of the paper? Because it doesn't matter if you write on those booklets. Make, make little jottings down the side of maybe key events that are happening or little little notes for yourself so that when you're looking for key information that later on, you know which paragraph to go to. I know children that uh, underline words or phrases or they highlight words and phrases sometimes if they had a highlighter. Obviously, you won't in the test, so just underline them because they think, oh, I bet that information's important later. So they're already thinking one step ahead of like the test creators. They're thinking... I know someone's written this test and I've got to answer questions on it. So I bet this information has been put in because I'm going to be asked a question on it later. And it's a really clever way of kind of being one step ahead of the, of the test and, you know, having evidence ready and underlined in your text that you think might be useful. And it will help you find things quickly later when you need to. And the second one, this is my favorite thing to do here, which is visualizing. Our brains are built for imagery, right? Think about it. You know, we're, you're looking at the screen right now. We, we tend to... Uh, we tend to look at things and we mem memorize things as sort of images because that's more natural to us. Um, if I asked you to maybe think of your favorite film or your favorite TV series or something like that, then the chances are you could probably close your eyes and like play it through in your head, right? You can, you can almost see what happens. You might even be able to memorize the whole thing. But if I asked you to recite your favorite book to me word for word from memory, you probably can't even do the first word. Maybe you can do the first sentence or a push. Do you know what I mean? So trying to visualize what you're reading as you go, turning it into a bit of a film in your head is going to make it more likely that you remember the actual flow of the story as you're reading it because you've turned it into a little film. And it's not hard to remember a you know a five-minute film once you've seen it once or twice. My next tip, not really a tip, don't be a donut. Don't be a donut. There's so many things you can do to be a donut. If the question says tick one, please just tick one. If it says tick two, please just tick two. Just do the thing it says. Write one word. It means write one word. The amount of times I've seen children write two words for their one word answer. And one of the words is correct, but the other one's not in it. Shouldn't be there so they don't get the mark. Um, write the group of words that. Again, this suggests that there's more than one word. Otherwise, it wouldn't say write the group of words. This is the most important one for me. It's the questioning word. So at the start of each question, typically, it's going to start with one of these six words, isn't it? How, why, when, what, where, and who. If you've got a where question and you're putting your answer as um, yellow fish, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, right? It's a where question. So I already know that's wrong. I don't even know. I don't even need to know what the question is or the text is to know that that is wrong. Unless there's a place called yellow fish. Maybe there is. But you get the idea, right? A who question is going to be asking for a name of some sort. So just be really careful. You're going to see a lot of why questions in the in the um, test because that leads to a lot of inference. You know, why does a character do something? Why did this happen? Why did the narrator write this part? And that's where it's asking you to dig a little bit deeper and look for evidence. So that's what I want to say right now. And do try to get this into your heads and remember it as well. Every question in this paper every single year is answerable using evidence in the text because it's a reading test. 
So if you're sat there thinking, nope, can't find any evidence for this one, can't find the answer, and you're thinking, right, I'm going to tell them they've made a mistake on the test, and you're the only one sat there with your hand up, you've just got to you've got to pull that back in and think maybe I'm wrong, maybe I've just misread something, or I've or I've glossed over the evidence, I've not read between the lines enough, I've not thought deeply enough about what I'm reading, because it's always there. Every answer can be proved because if it couldn't be proved, it wouldn't be in this test. Because that's all this test does at the end of the day. It's testing your ability to read. And the only way they can get you to prove your ability on reading is by asking you some questions about the thing you're reading for you to prove that you read it properly and understood it. And my final thing on this part here about don't be, don't be a donut is do take note of the marks. One mark, two marks, and three marks. That's all you'll ever get in the uh, English reading test. One mark questions, two mark questions, three mark questions. Normally, there's only two or three three mark questions normally towards the end, but there's gonna be a lot of one and two mark questions throughout. If something is two marks, then you know there's a bit more to it. That will give you a hint. If you've only written one word for a two mark question, you can guarantee yourself you're not getting two marks. There's gonna be more to it. So my next point is, and I'm, if, you're, if you're laughing at home thinking, yeah, this is me, I, it's all of you. Actually check your answers. You know when your teacher says, check your answers, and you go, okay, and then you pretend, and you kind of like th flick through your booklet thinking, la-da-da, I'm not checking anything really, but the teacher thinks I am. Don't do that. Actually check your answers. We know that you don't really like to do it, and you just kind of look at your own answers and go, oh, that looks nice. I wrote that word nicely. I agree. Of course you agree. You wrote it before. So that's not how you check your answers. Like these classic things here, look. Write one word and they've underlined two. Or in this, this is a really famous question. And um, teachers like to la laugh about this every single year because it's just a, it's a bit of a, a funny thing that happens in the SATs is this question here when we're practicing. Gabby uses the Spanish word gato for cat. Who else in the story speaks Spanish? People don't read the question properly. They see the word cat, they see the word Spanish, and they just put an answer of the cat. The cat doesn't speak Spanish. Not in this story, anyway. It's just a donut mistake. So you've got to check. So how do you check, then? How do you actually check? Well, it works better in maths. It does work better in maths, but I'm still going to tell you the same strategy, all right? So you can use this in all your tests. Checking your answers is not about looking at what you wrote and then just kind of agreeing with yourself without really checking. You're not actually checking anything, then. You're just going back to what you originally thought and affirming that same thought. What you should do is actually just cover up your answer so you're not thinking about what you wrote before and then answer the question again. Like actually just go and check, actually go and look in the text and find a bit of evidence that supports what you're thinking because you might find something different. You might go, oh, I thought I've misread this sentence and I thought this was a bit of evidence for my answer but actually that's, that means something completely different. And then you can go back and you can write your new answer in there. But if you just look at your answer that you've already got, you're not really going to check it properly. And the last thing to do with checking is, is definitely to check the number of marks. You know, I've seen a lot of people get one mark on two mark questions where they just haven't realized it's a two mark question. They think they've answered it fully, but actually there was another point they needed to make to get the second mark. So just check, does, does your answer suit the number of marks that are actually available there? Okay, right. Last one. You might not agree with this. You know, it's classic. Most children go, whoa, I ain't doing them. That's loads of writing. Do I look like I want to write that much? Guys, three mark questions. Don't be scared of them. They're actually quite easy. They're designed in a way that are actually quite easy. I promise you. All right. And even if you don't get three marks, getting two marks on a three mark question is the easiest thing in the world. And it's two marks. You might as well do that. Look at this question, for example. Even without the text, I can just explain to you how easy this question would be to answer. This is one of those end of paper questions that people often go, oh, I don't want to do that. It's going to be too hard for me. Don't be that person. Look, think about the whole text. How is a mysterious atmosphere created? Give two ways using evidence from the text to support your answer. This is how you get three marks. Are you ready? First of all, understanding the question. It's a how question and it's what am I specifically looking for? A mysterious atmosphere. How is there a mysterious atmosphere? So from the text, you just need to find two points that make two things in the text that make it feel mysterious. Okay, whatever those two things are, you're going to write them down. Thing one and thing two. There's your two things that you think makes it quite mysterious. That's two marks already. and We haven't even used any evidence yet. To add evidence, all you have to do is pick one of them 
and just quote something from the text to prove it. Prove that you've read the text by using the phrase, because the text says, and then insert what the text actually says, which backs up your original point. Three marks, done. You don't even need to do evidence on both of them, okay? I would recommend doing evidence on both of them. Think about why. Because let's say your first bit of evidence was actually really weak. You might be you might be lucky with your second bit of evidence, which gets you your third mark. So it's still better to try and evidence them both to guarantee that three marks. But at the end of the day, as long as you've got two valid points and one of them's evidence from the text by saying the text says, you're going to be fine, to be honest with you. We'll come back to three mark questions in a minute because I've got an actual example of it for you that we'll do in about three minutes, okay? So um, this was the mark scheme for that question, by the way. And it's really interesting to look at this, guys, just so you know, this is what teachers see. So we have a mark scheme and it tells us exactly what we're allowed to give you marks for. It's quite long, isn't it? Just for one question. It says here, award three marks for two acceptable points and at least one with evidence. Exactly what I said. So all you need to remember is two points, one evidence, two points, one evidence. You get three marks for that. That's amazing. That's like answering three questions just for doing this thing. Two points, one evidence. Epic. So in this one, you could have put something like this. Every single sound goes away. There's the first point. And it's like her mum tries to cover up the situation. So these two things is what the person's decided makes it mysterious. And then the evidence from the text is even her footsteps, because that's obviously something that happened directly in, in the text. So that's, there, that's three marks. <laughs> I mean, look at the next one. It's mysterious because suddenly everything is back to normal. So that's their first point, but there's no evidence for that one. And then the second one, the lady disappeared is their second point. So there's another thing that makes it mysterious. But this time, look, they've used quotations and they've done something from the text. They haven't used the phrase because the text says, but it's the same thing. They have quoted something directly from the text, which backs up the point that the lady disappeared. Three marks. It's so easy, guys. And the best bit is, if you don't do any evidence, you can still get two marks just by writing the two points that you already knew because you've read the text. So don't skip the three markers. They are not as hard as you think. Sometimes they can be tricky, but generally you're going to get yourself at least two marks on those questions just for minimal effort. So what we're going to do now for the last part of this video is actually I've picked out some questions from past SATS papers that historically have been answered very incorrectly. So we've got a lot of data in the country that lets us know that children have misanswered, that's not a word, or answered incorrectly these particular questions. I've picked them out for you and I've put them on the screen. Let's get ready. First one from the 2017 paper. This was the question and I've given you the text here by the way guys so you can actually pause the video in a minute and have a go. Look at the paragraph beginning. She knew the universal rule. What does the word universal tell you about the rule? I've put two answers on the screen that are classic answers from children which would not get you the mark. Pause the video, have a think yourself about what your answer would be. So hopefully you've had a think. Let's have a look at the mark scheme and see exactly where we went wrong. Because I think that first one sounds okay, doesn't it? Lots of people know it, surely that's what it means. Well, you've got to be very careful in the reading test with your phrases. Lots of people. Couldn't I say that 10 people is lots of people? I wouldn't attribute the word universal with 10 people. I think it's bigger than that. And that's what the mark scheme says as well. It is something that everyone knows, not lots of people. Everyone knows. Look, both answers give you this idea of everyone or everywhere. It's known all around the world. It's a rule that everybody should keep. You must grasp that sense of universal being more than just most people. It means everybody, okay? That's what it means. So be very careful with your answers. Here's the next question. It's a three marker. Don't pause the video and think, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave now because it's three marks. I want you to look at this, this now and think I could get three marks on this quite quickly. This is a hard three mark question, by the way, and I still think you'll be fine. Using the rule, two points and one piece of evidence by directly quoting the text. You ready guys? So here's the question. Look at page nine. This is page nine. I've put it on the screen for you. 
How is the whale made to seem mysterious? There's your keyword, and it's about the whale. Explain two ways giving evidence. So I want one point, two points, and then a bit of evidence to back up one of those points. Pause the video, have a go. So there are actually lots of things within this text, maybe six or seven different things that hint towards the whale being a bit mysterious. And by mysterious, thinking of the root word mystery, it means that the character maybe doesn't know something about it. Maybe it doesn't even know that it's a whale. All right, so let's have a look. We've got the sound of the whale there. The fact that he describes it as the sound already shows that perhaps that sound could be our first bit of evidence. I'm just going to put that for now. There we go. That's my first point I want to make. I want to make the point that this is a, this is a sound that he doesn't recognize. Um, what else have we got here? Let's keep going. Michael picks himself up and looks over the side. A black shape. So he describes it as a black shape. Think about it. That adds mystery, right? That's a very vague term. So we've got the black shape. That's an interesting point. Now, at this point, all I'd have to do is give some evidence to support my answer on what I mean by this. Because right now, I'm not going to get any marks for this because it doesn't mean anything. I've not explained anything. So if I ex actually add in some explaining now, here's my quote from the text. And my explanation is going to be, um, this uh, is described as a sound. Okay, there's my first point. And what I'm going to finish up with this in a minute is say that both of these points suggest that he doesn't know that it's a whale. It adds mystery. Black shape is my next thing I'm going to quote. I've done it a bit backwards this time, guys. I'll put the quote in first. Um, this adds mystery. Why? Think about it. Why does this add mystery? Because it's vague. And I'll leave it there. It's vague. I don't know. I don't know what's a black shape. There could be anything. Okay. That's just two points. Guys, there's so many more you could have done as well. Much, much bigger than the biggest dolphin. Showed about five meters from the boat. It was like a polished rock. Again, very mysterious. We don't know what it is then. Our point here could be, it's, it was like a polished rock, in quotes. Shows that the, that the author, the narrator, sorry, doesn't know what he's looking at. Meaning it's mysterious. Okay, there's another two marks there. On its rounded side was a slit flattened uh, like a flattened S. Bigger than a man's two clenched fists with a raised lip around it. So there's so much stuff in this paragraph that shows that the character doesn't know what he's looking at. Okay? And at this point, he works it out. A whale. It's dark head and blowhole. That's what he had seen. So even this sentence, this sentence here even shows that before this sentence, he didn't know what it was. So there are so many points you could make here, but all you needed was two things. Two things from the text to show it's mysterious and a bit of evidence backing it up. There we go. Okay, next up. Uh, again, from the 2017 stats, I think this is the last one, but I liked this uh, This year, has some good questions. This time, I'm going to let you pause the video completely yourself and read this. Read the question and just come back when you think you've got an answer. Okay, so the question was, look at the paragraph, which I've put here. Michael, carefully Michael leaned. Where was the whale? This is a great question because everybody falls into the trap. I'm going to show you the trap that everyone falls into. You ready? They read the text carefully. Michael leaned over to look. On one side of the boat lay the whale's tapering tail. They get to that point, most people. They stop because they're confident now. They've just read on one side of the boat and they've just read that we've seen the whale's tail. So the whale is clearly at the side of the boat and they move on. That's wrong. Can you see why? Can you keep reading and tell me why? Well, it says, on the other side, on the other side, the head with its scarred lines lay like a piece of huge dark wreckage. So hang on, if we've got the boat and we've got the tail on one side and we've got the head on the other side, where's the whale? It can't be on both sides at the same time. It must have some body going, going uh, between it, right? So there we are. The whale is underneath the boat. It's not at the side of the boat. That's just one half of it. It must be under the boat. That's called inference because we had to work that out. It never told us it was under the boat, but with our common sense and, in, and evidence in the text, we can work out that it must be under the boat. Otherwise, we couldn't have its two halves 
either side of the boat. Okay, moving on to the 2018 SATs. This was another, another good question. It says, look at the section headed, why are people concerned about the giant panda? Find and copy one word which shows there are lots of things we do not yet know about the giant pandas. Pause the video, have a go. So the word we were looking for here is puzzling. Well done if you found it. Now here's my, my thought train on that. If we're describing the creatures as puzzling, another word for that is confusing, okay? Because we don't know. We're confused because we don't know everything about them yet. And that ties back really nicely to this, which shows that there are lots of things we do not yet know about them. Puzzling means confusing, which means that. That was my thought train. And you had to read through and find that one word to do that. Because it's near the end, what they're doing is they're relying on children thinking they found a word before that and just going with it and then moving on and not actually reading to the end of the paragraph to see that the second to last word was the word that they needed. In this one, we had a poem here called Granny. I've copied the whole poem in for you. And the question is, what was one effect of the poet getting injured in the war? Now, the way to think about this is effect. What does that mean, one effect? Well, it kind of means like what was a, a, a direct result, yeah? What was a consequence of the poet getting injured in the war? So this is a really important bit because we've got to find the part in which the poet is injured and then read after it to find out an effect of that injury. What was the result of him being injured? Have a little read, pause the video, have a little read of the poem, find it and try to write down um, an effect. If you can, write down more than one, just for bonus points, okay? Just from me, because there's more than one point you could make. Okay, so there's a few points here. So right here you can see, look, years later, war broke out and I became a soldier and was wounded while in France. Back home in hospital, so there's one effect. He went home. That would have got you the mark. Done. Move on. Okay, here's another one you could have put. Uh, he ended up in hospital. Yeah, these are both effects. These are both things that happened. Oops, I can't spell. Because he got wounded. What else could we say? Um, he ended up in a small town close to where his nan was. There's another one. Uh, what else was the direct result? She, his nan visited him. His granny visited him. There's a fourth one. There's so many different points we could have made here. All right. But any of those are absolutely fine. But we just had to find the right part in the poem and then look for evidence afterwards of an effect. And the hardest bit is just understanding that effect means result or consequence. What happened because of him being injured in the war? Okay, one more from 2018. This is my favorite question. I love this question. She came and I still vividly recall. What do the words vividly recall mean? I'm gonna stop you right there. First of all, it's two marks. That gives you a hint. If it's given you two words in what you're trying to explain, you must explain, you must describe them both. What does vividly mean and what does recall mean? Try to write one word that means vividly, one word that means recall, and then you've got yourself an answer. Pause the video, come back when you wanna see what the answer was. Okay, so first of all, firstly, the easier one is recall. What does that mean? It means to remember, right? That's what it means to recall something. When you're thinking, I'm recalling on that day, I'm remembering. Now vividly, this is where people struggled, what does it mean? Well, you think of vivid with colors, right? When it's really bright, but we don't want to say brightly remember. That doesn't make sense. Vivid in this case just means strong, doesn't it? Like a strong memory. Um, so you could put, it's not the best word, but you could put strongly remember. I strongly remember this, okay? All right, so vividly just has to show that it's more than just a normal memory. It's a really detailed, which would be another word, detailed memory, okay? So you have to do both. Otherwise, you won't get the two cards. So vividly recall, detailed, um, or remember in detail. I've, I've written it the wrong way around, guys, but you get the idea. Remember in detail or strongly remember anything that describes what both the words mean. And here's one more from the 2018 sets. It says, look at the last verse beginning she came, which I've copied here for you. Find and copy a group of words that shows that his granny makes a difference to the poet during her visit. So first of all, during her visit, that's a really important time frame for when this is happening, right? We don't want to do it before she comes. But during her visit, find and copy words that show that she makes a difference. To make a difference, you have to first understand 
what's going on before the granny came, right? So thinking about it, he was miserable, wasn't he? He was injured in the war. He was obviously not having a good time. He was in hospital. So can't have been feeling very good. So a difference would be not feeling like that, like that anymore, right? So where's the evidence in here that shows that the granny made a difference? Hmm. Pause the video. So in this one here, there's lots of tricks, okay? You might say, you know, I don't know, it, it was weird and now he's feeling weird. Or she hobbled through and I don't know, she smiled. Maybe that's what you think. But the bit that's really obviously the part where the author has shown that um, she's made a difference is this bit here. And love lit up the day. Clearly, it was the love from Granny that lit up, which means changed, made a difference, a positive difference to his day. So there's the answer. Love lit up the day. And you couldn't have gotten a mark in for writing anything else. You had to write this bit. Love lit up the day. Excellent stuff. I've got two questions left, guys. So these were from last year. So really fresh questions now from the 2022 SATs. So I've put all of the text here on the left for you, including the bit at the top, which just summarizes it, and then, the, and then a chunk of the text. And... Um, Here's the question. It says, what effect did the knock on the door have on Veronica, Veronica and her family? Well, I'm just going to dive straight into it with you because I've actually put the answers on the screen, which I forgot about. So here's a classic one. She was excited. This is where it happens in the text, right? Bear with me. Let's read this together. I'm going to go up a little bit. Veronica, your boots, uncle reminded me as I helped him and Sophie up the steps. Yes, uncle. Thank you. Always look after your boots. Look after your boots and they will look after you. Before I could reply, a banging on the front door startled all three of us. They were here. Megan, my captain, beamed at me, her face shiny and excited. You can see, can't you, why people think, oh, she's excited. What did the knock on the door do? Well, she's excited because she's excited now to go with them to her football tournament. We've got to be more careful than this. What effect did the knock on the door have on Veronica and her family? What immediate effect? Look at the text again. Before I could reply, a banging on the front door startled all three of us. That's your answer. Don't overthink it. The answer is, it startled them all. It made them jump. It gave them a shock. That's what startled means. Okay? So you've got to be super careful with that. And not put, she was excited. Here's my last question. And I say this to last because it's my favorite question um, from the last year's paper. Because almost everybody got this wrong. Almost everybody got this wrong. All right, so I'm, j I'm not going to say anything. I'm just gonna, it's the second one that I'm more interested in, guys, but you might want to answer the first one first just so it actually makes sense, okay? So pause the video, read the text. Um, you can read the little summary here that I've, put, I've snipped from the top of it. Have a go at 32A and then have a go at 32B, and B is the one that everyone gets wrong. So have a go. Right. A, what was Penelope's mother's explanation for what Penelope had seen? Well, this was quite a straightforward retrieval question because look, the mum literally says to her, there's no one child, she exclaimed. You've imagined her. It's easy to think you see someone in the dusk. So she just thinks that, um, that she imagined it, right? So that's a fairly easy question to answer. Now, this one is the one that gets people. Why might Penelope have been frustrated by her mother's explanation? I'm going to write what most children write and don't get the mark for. You ready? Most people say, because she saw, she saw the woman. Like that. And they don't get the mark. Because she saw the woman. That's not it. She, think about the question here, guys, and really think about this with me. It's a deep question. Why might Penelope have been frustrated by her mother's explanation? Is she frustrated because she saw the woman? That would suggest that when she saw the woman, she got angry. Oh, I've seen that woman. Oh. That's not why she's frustrated. She's frustrated because her mother doesn't believe that she saw the woman. Do you see the difference in those answers? It's subtle, but it's crucial. She's frustrated because her mother dismisses what she's saying. She's frustrated because, she, because her mother thinks that she's making it up or thinks that she's imagining it. 
So it's all about her mother's reaction to what she said. She's frustrated because her mother doesn't believe her. Not frustrated because she saw the woman. You could say she's frustrated because she's certain she saw the woman and yet her mother doesn't believe her. That last bit of my sentence there is the most important part. And with that, I come to the end of this very long video, 35 minutes. Thank you so much for watching this whole thing. If, you, if you're doing your sats tomorrow, then good luck to you. If you're doing your sats later on in the month or next year, or whenever you're watching this, then I do hope my top tips and strategies and even a few question walkthroughs have helped you feel prepared for your test. Best of luck and do come back to this video and leave us a comment, guys. We'd love to hear. We read all your comments. We might not reply to everyone, but we read every single comment. We'd love to know how you get on. And we'd all, I'd also love to know whether you think this video has been helpful. Please leave us a like, subscribe to our channel, even share it with your friends if you want to help us grow, grow our audience. We'd much appreciate it. Have a great day, guys. See you soon.